James chapter five. Here we go, 20 verses. Now, now remember, remember how direct James is? Okay, warn, warn the person you brought today, okay? It's like super direct. And the reason for this is he's writing to the 12 tribes. He's writing to believing Jews and he's speaking like a father or like a dad. Now, if you had the privilege of having a dad or a father figure in your life and you ever had one of those dad talks, basically the whole book of James is a dad talk. And dads, when dads have dad talks, like when I talk to my kids, um, I don't like make apologies, I don't mince words, like I am just direct. And James is gonna be so direct and um, today's no exception, okay? So just everyone just, here we go. You are loved, remember, you are loved. And this will end well. Verse one, come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. <laughs> Welcome to church home. Verse two. <clears throat> Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Praise God. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person and he does not resist you. Okay, now we get a bit of a transition here. Are you ready? Breathe a little bit. I, I love this transition by James. This uh, it makes me laugh. Be patient therefore, brothers. I'm like. Okay, wow, the tone changed really fast there. You, know? you have fattened your hearts. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door, and as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. And of course, you have the steadfastness of, or you've heard of the steadfastness of, of Job. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, how many grew up in a family where this was quoted? Young man, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, I did. So that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you in church home suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone in church home cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, I love this verse, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, here is the climactic conclusion to the entire book from the half-brother of Jesus, James. He says this. Isn't this interesting? This is how he ends. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Isn't that beautiful? Contrary to popular opinion, the book of James is not mean. It's actually full of grace and the love of Jesus. And it ends with that we can cover a multitude of each other's sins by rescuing one another, loving one another, and caring for one another. I am so excited to share this passage with you. For the next two and a half hours, we are going to so <laughs> dig, all right, in my dreams, in my dreams. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you so much for the day, uh, the, the, really the moments we get to share. 
I thank you for community. I thank you for relationship and friendship. Lord, I do pray for anyone here today who has a heavy heart, anyone here today who is hurting or struggling, anyone here today who feels alone. God, I ask that by your story and your word that you would heal hearts and restore people, strengthen people today. Lord, we, we, we wanna be so aware of one another today and care for one another today. Lord, I, I pray even as this service and we, we, we tell your story and we sing some songs, if, if there's someone in this room that we need to care for and someone that you want us to consider and, and, and reach out, I pray you'd speak to us even while we're sitting here. We want to live, love, and look like you, Jesus. Thank you for all the off-season moves the Hawks are making to set us up for this incredible Super Bowl run we're going to go on. Give coach, all the coaches, wisdom at the Combine in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. I'm telling you, prayer works. <laughs> do, you, um, do you struggle getting to the point? Do you ever struggle getting to the point? If, if you're like me, um, getting to the point, which is really imperative when you're a preacher, can sometimes be a challenge for me. And if some of you, if you knew my dad, um, who started the church and pastored here for 20 years, my dad needed to contextualize everything. He always wanted to give context. In fact, dad was known for like when he was in a series of sermons, um, he would do review from the week before and half of his sermon would be a review from the week before. And you'd be looking at the clock like, dad, like you gotta get going here, man. This was, we're all still on last week. Um, and so I inherited that blessing and I love to give context. I love to, and, and so as a result, um, Chelsea and I fight. <clears throat> but the point is, like we'll be in meetings together, right? Chelsea and I both uh, get to serve here at church home. And so we'll be at meetings together and I'll be like building like my, my, my case, you know, if you will, like building in, and I'll be sitting with like our elders. I'll be sitting with Leon or sitting with Troy and, and, and I'll be like, hey, and, and, and Chelsea just, she knows where I'm going and eventually just like, so anyways, we need to, we need to help the volunteers. And I'll be like, babe, wait, not yet. I want to go back to 92 and my dad's heart for people, you know, like, and like, take the elders on a journey. She's like, babe, the meeting cannot be this long. So, all right, so I struggle, okay, sue me. I struggle with getting to the point. So much so, and Troy's here, we were recently in a meeting and we were doing an exercise. This, this really happened, Mark will, Mark will verify. And in this meeting, we were kind of sharing like how each other helps the team and then how each other hurts the team, trying to like get candid and honest. And so I was going around the room and one of the leaders, I was like, okay, hey, I, I was gonna talk to him about, I feel like in meetings, um, you need to get to the point faster. Like I'm the biggest hypocrite, who does this? This is, this, is, this is the problem with your pastor. You're like, you're not my pastor, I'm just a guest. Okay, but the point is, so I start talking to one of the leaders and I go, hey, I just, man, I, I love you, I think, you, I, you know, I affirm you, I appreciate you, I honor you, but in meetings, like it just takes so long for you to get to the point, like for instance, da, 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 and, and, and so I'm 15 minutes in, to telling this leader he needs to get to the point more in meetings. True story, Troy will stand by this. Troy finally drops his head on the desk laughing. And I, and I learn, I go, excuse me, Troy, what are you laughing about? And he's like, bro, it's been like 15 minutes you're telling so-and-so to get to the point and you can't even get to the point. And I'm like, Troy, you're fired. <laughs> so Troy's here today as a volunteer. Um, <laughs> kidding, relax, relax. <laughs> oh man, can you imagine? Um, like if we've gone through the book of James so far and you're kind of like, whoa man, like it's a lot. Like I just need James to get to the point. Now he is very direct, but I, I understand. Like we, we've gone now four chapters, we've gone five weeks, gone through a lot of verses, a lot of content, a lot of metaphor, a lot of example. It's been amazing. But if you've kind of come to this point like, Man, I just kind of need, like, what's the, like, in a nutshell, like, what is James saying? Uh, uh, the last chapter is going to serve you very, very well. Because in essence, James is going to bottom line it. And we've got 20 verses. I see probably four different sections here. We'll do our best to kind of touch every verse, but for sake of time. So we're not here for two and a half hours. We won't get to all of the nitty gritty of James chapter five. But in essence, it is James going, all right, I'm gonna bottom line it. So much so, the last two verses that may not feel like a climactic conclusion actually are 
a climactic conclusion, and I cannot wait to get to verses 19 and 20. But of course, we've got to approach one of Father James, Dad James, James who speaks to us like a dad, one of his favorite points, if you haven't picked up in the five chapters, he likes to talk to rich people. Have you noticed this? Like he really wants to make a point to rich people. And of course, if historically you go back and do some research, you discover that there were wealthy people in these early churches, these early communities spread around the known world. Again, he's speaking to the 12 tribes dispersed in the known world. And historically, we see records of very wealthy people that were a part of these communities. One record that I read shows that there was, you know, the communion, which is a practice that believers have been doing for thousands of years where we get together and share wine and bread and remember the sacrifice and victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, his defeat of death, his resurrection. It's a beautiful thing. We share communion here at church home. And one record records that in these communion celebrations, which were more like a potluck, anybody remember potlucks? Right? Did you grow up in church going to potlucks? Yeah, oh my word. There was always like a couple of families. You were, you were so happy that they were gonna bring food to the potluck. And there was always a couple of families like, can we give them like the week off for the potluck? Because, you know, and mom would make you like eat everyone's food to honor every family. And you went home with a stomach ache. But the point is, like these communion feasts are kind of like a potluck and it was more than just like a little wafer and, and, and some juice. It was like a, a proper feast. But one of the writings records that the, there were wealthy people showing up with bottles of wine, tons of food, and there were very poor people, part of the same community, showing up with barely any food to contribute, and the wealthy people were gorging themselves on wine and food, while the poor people, if you will, on the other end of the table, barely had anything to eat. And some of the writings we receive in the New Testament are to this fact, like what is going on? You call yourself a family, but you are gorging yourself on your food at the Feast of Communion while people down the table have nothing to eat. Basically, what is wrong with you? Are we family or not? For instance, I'm a dad of three kids. There has never been a meal where I'm like today, only Zion will eat. Elliot, Grace, you will watch and be hungry and be grateful. No, as a father, I feed all my children. So God is a father and he loves all of his children, no matter your bank account status. And he wants all his children to participate and be blessed and be filled and be warmed and be clothed and be provided for. And so James, once again, wants to challenge the attitude. Please listen now. There is nowhere in here that James says money is bad. No, 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 money's not the problem. Our heart is the problem and our attitude is the problem. And I think more than anything in these opening six verses that are basically a warning for those with money or for those who desire money, I think we can learn a lot about what James is saying. For instance, I think one of the points he's saying, whether you have money or you're desirous of money and probably somewhere in there we all kind of fit and, and, and by the way, be careful what you wish for, right? Like sometimes you get all the money you want and Biggie is right, more money, more problems, <laughs> right? And so, and, and so then sometimes you have no money, but you are happy and content and you're living this adventure with Jesus. So money is never the point. Money is never the goal. We don't serve money, we serve God. And as we serve God, our money is going to have a mission and a purpose, and our money is going to serve God. So we don't work for money. We don't live for money. We work for God and live for God, right? So he's making that point, and he's also saying, hey, to whom much is given, much is required. If you have resource in community, if God has blessed you financially, then in community, we ought to, if you have resource, take care of one another. We ought to be considerate of those in need within our own community. We ought, to, we ought to find someone who's like, you know, maybe they're, they're in a tough spot, tough jam, things are difficult, times are tight, maybe they've lost their job, and we ought to bless them, take them to lunch, ask them how they're doing, what else can we bless you with and do for you? That's the kind of community we want to be. Can I hear an amen? I think one of, the, one of the observations that I make, I think James is saying here is, do we trust God or do we trust money? Where's our trust? And I wanted to remind all of us today, as James wants to remind us, that no, we trust God. 
Money is not our trust. Notice what he says. He says, you lay up treasures in the last days. That is ironic. Think about what he's saying. You are laying up treasure like Scrooge McDuck. You gather your gold coins and you swim in them and Jesus is coming back tomorrow. That's foolish. You see what he's saying? You're laying up treasure in the last days, which is to say life is a vapor. Remember what he said to the rich earlier in the book? He's like, you're like the grass. You're like a flower that fades. Here today, gone tomorrow. But you know what? That's true of all of us. Life is a vapor. Life is short. There is nothing more fulfilling to do with your money than be a blessing. And we believe that you are blessed. If you're here today and you're blessed, and you say, Judah, how do you define blessed? You have more than enough. You have $1 more than what your bills require. I consider you blessed. And you know what? That extra dollar is so that you can be a blessing. You can be a blessing to people around you. What a privilege if we, if we understand that we can be blessed to be a blessing. I think one of the other points he's making to those of us with resource and finance and, and money, and, and frankly, that's pr pretty much most of us, we're, we're very blessed. Our country has a lot of challenges and difficulties, but we are blessed in this country. And frankly, so many of us in this room are, are blessed. And so this passage would probably speak to most of us that, hey, are, are we caring about our money more than people? Do we care about our bank account and our savings and our checking and retirement more than people? And he's saying that's wrong. He's saying to the wealthy people in community. Now remember, these are believers. I know he's talking very, you know, strong, but he, he never says you're, you're not believers, God doesn't love you. He just says, hey, the way you're treating your money seems to tell us that you trust your money more than God and you love your money more than people. No, we love people. We love God. Nothing's more important than God and people. The true treasure is relationship. The true treasure is friendship. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world financially, but in the process lose his soul and have no friends? No, we exist as a community to have relationship and friendship. And so the challenge is there. And I'll leave you to read again those six verses. And they are challenging, but I think incredibly applicable to our lives. We all probably could use an afternoon where we go, hey, I me think about kind of how I think about my finances and resources. Do I hold it up as a trophy, or do I simply see resources and finances as a means to provide for my family and be a blessing to my community family? What if we lived as a community open-handed all the time? We were the kind of place where we would give all the time. Now, what you may not know, Pastor Marlene Ostrom is sitting here on the front row, and her and Grandpa Don, my truest grandfather, um, had a huge impact in this church all the way back in 1992. And Grandpa Don used to do something called the Holy Ghost handshake. Now, I grew up, you, you remember this, Aunt Marlene, I grew up in church, in a church before we started this one, where a handshake was just a handshake. And then Pastor Don showed up at City Church, now church home, and almost every Sunday that I can remember, first of all, I looked for Grandpa Don because I was really hoping for a Holy Ghost handshake. Because his Holy Ghost handshake, I really felt the love of Jesus, because in that handshake was a hundred dollar bill every single time. And so, man, Sunday would come around, I'd be like, anybody seen Grandpa Don? Because I need to give him a handshake. <laughs> Woo! Feel Jesus. And I'm not proposing that uh, we all, you know, get hundos in our hands and, I mean, it probably wouldn't hurt us and give it away. But the point is, it, it, it taught me something as a 13-year-old young man. That what a thrill, like what, you could take a hundred and I don't know, get a, get a shirt, you know, take a hundred and get a pair of jeans, or you could take a hundred dollars and experience the thrill of blessing people, spontaneously blessing people. And I believe that's still a part of who we are as a community. We are a spontaneously generous community. And I pray that'll always be true. I was taught as a young man, when people compliment what you're wearing, you say, hey, do you want it? You can have it. And that's the way my dad was. You say, oh, I love your tie. And dad would say, well, here, you can have it. And that's just the kind of the person he was, and I just believe that's the kind of community we want to be. Now, you know, keep your pants on, but, you know, we, we ought to be the kind of community that, you know, wants to, wants to bless one another. And you, you imagine if we all are a blessing to one another, we will all be provided for, and we'll all be blessed. Can I hear an amen? 
Now the transition happens, and it's, it's, as I said, it's pretty sudden, but he goes on in verse 7. He says, now be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. That's not a popular word. Be patient. See how the farmer waits. Establish your hearts, waiting and patience. Isn't that interesting? Of all the things James could talk about at the conclusion of his letter, he wants to warn us about our money and how we relate to it. And then he wants to say, hey, brothers and sisters. Now remember, the, the, the gruff warning, he's now telling the same people to be patient. And by the way, he's calling them brothers and sisters. So if you feel bad about the, the money section and the part, and he's like really intense, hey, he still calls. Even those struggling with how they relate to their money, in the next verse he says, hey, brothers, and, you're, you're, you're still brothers and sisters. And he says, you're going to need patience following Jesus. I wish we talked about this more. Bob was talking about it last night. I wish we were honest with each other more, that following Jesus requires a lot of patience. Oh, it is exhilarating. It's incredible. There's no other life apart from Jesus, but you are going to need patience. I just figured we'd wait for a second. Just to drive home the point, you know? We're gonna, we're gonna need patience. I, I, don't, I don't think anyone has labeled this, ge this generation or this age, or this era, this is the patient age. I don't think that's how we named it. I, don't, I think that's, we're, that, we're like the microwave age. We're the Siri age, right? I was with my friend the other day and I'm like, hey, who won the Super Bowl? I can't remember. He's like, if only we had a device we could talk to that would give us the answer instantaneously. Only, if only, and I'm like, I get the point. Hey Siri, who won the Super Bowl in 86? You know, like, it, it was the Bears. But the point is, it's 85 actually, but the point is, we have a generation, and all of us have been affected now, where things just happen really fast. And James, how ironic is this? How relevant is this right now in 2018? He says, you're going to need to be patient. And he gives us three examples. The farmer, the prophets, and unfortunately, he gives us Job as an example. Wah, wah. <clears throat> but notice, he says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. See how the farmer waits. Now, let's talk about this just for a couple minutes. How does the farmer wait? Well, I'll tell you what the farmer doesn't do. The farmer doesn't get a chair and look at his fields and say, okay, God, when you want this puppy to grow, I'll be here. How does the farmer wait? He cultivates the soil, he plants a seed, and then he expects the seasons to deliver the rain necessary for fruition and for growth. So how does the farmer wait? And this is where we've got the wrong idea of patience and waiting. We see waiting as a stagnant practice, but waiting is absolutely something that is active, something that you're involved with, which is to say, could we say this? I don't know, let's try it, that sometimes following Jesus is kind of broken into three seasons. There's a cultivating season, there's a sowing season, and then there is a expecting, i.e. waiting season. And you know what? I think they just repeat over and over. You cultivate, you break up, challenging, difficult ground, you cultivate, and then you sow seeds. How many know we're not a savior, but we are a sower? Right? Our job is to sow seeds of love and care and compassion and understanding, and we sow those seeds, and then you know what? We expect God to do what only he can do. And you know what? That farmer waits with full expectation that if he planted a seed, the rains will come because that's how God has set the seasons in motion. And when the rains come, the fruit is going to be there. Waiting on God is not wishing on a star. Waiting on God is not like, well, sure hope you do something up there. And in the meantime, I'm just going to be down here kind of feeling sorry for myself because you bless the Joneses, but you never bless my family. So here I am. Oh, yep, you haven't come yet. Figures. Yep, I figured that would be the case. You don't love me as much. No, that, that's not. It's, it's I know God is going to deliver. 
I know God is going to provide. I know. It's this active expectation and hope. As sure as the farmer knows, the rains will come. And by the way, if the, rains, if the rain is late, the farmer still, what other choices the farmer has? He still believes that the rain will come. If the early rain doesn't come, he's going to expect the latter rain to come. If the latter rain is delayed, he's going to still expect there's going to be rain. Do you still expect from God that he is faithful and true? You know, it's amazing because I think sometimes as believers, we don't talk enough about uh, the meanwhile. Isn't that funny? Have you seen that in the Bible? It says meanwhile. Meanwhile, right? The meanwhile or the meantime, it's actually like a big part of the story of God. There is a lot of waiting periods in the Bible. Have you seen them? Some of them are hundreds of years. Unfortunately, some of them are thousands of years, and then some are a few months, praise God. But, but there is a lot of lead time, if you will. There's a lot of lag time. There's a lot of in-between time. And I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, why, why would God do it like that? You know what I mean? Like, when you want to get from here to there, you know, I'd be like, uh, you know, God, it would be nice if you were just like, you want to get there? Bam! And like twice in your life that happens, you know what I mean? And just appreciate when God does do that. But most of the time it's like, you want to get there? Okay, the next five years, I want you to trust me. And you're like, Lord, I don't know if I can do that. And what does that tell us about God? That actually not getting, getting there has never been the point. And God, God thinks it's so cool that you're believing for that new house or, you know, you asked for a new car or, you know, you, you, you're believing for the new job. Man, God is with you. He loves you. He's for you. But let's not forget that actually on your way there might be more the point of life than getting there. You know why? Because God wants you to want him more than you want that job. He wants you to realize that the job will come and go, but he is forever. And it's amazing how when we, like the farmer, wait and expect for good things, boy, we'll meet God. And if you're like me, guess where I've met God in the most real times? Lag times. <laughs> like, when you finally arrive, you got so much to do. It's like, Lord, I love you. Let's do this. Come on. But man, when you're in those, one of those extended waiting seasons, you know, where you have to use your patience and not just talk about it at, at coffee with a fellow believer, but you actually have to use your patience. It's amazing how you'll connect with God. And let's not wish those seasons away. Those seasons are precious. Those seasons when you're like, Lord, what am I doing? Where am I? What's going on? I've been praying forever. Lord, I wanna get remarried. Hopefully you're not currently married when you pray that. But you know what I mean? But maybe you've lost a loved one or maybe, you know, and you have a desire to, to, to marry again, it's like, it's like, Lord, I, I want it. What's going on? And I believe, I'll believe with you. We'll pray that you'll, you know, find the uh, love of your life again. It'll be amazing. But in the meantime, you have an opportunity to exercise patience and connect with God. He says, consider the farmer, consider the prophets, consider Job. Ah, have you read Ezekiel or Jeremiah? It is so bizarre. Right? And these guys, basically the prophets, what they did, and of course the, the Jewish recipients of this letter would know the story of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They would receive these, these words from God and stand in front of nations and be like, God says he's going to bring rain soon. And you got to be careful when you say soon because God soon is not like our soon at all, right? A day is like a thousand years to God. So when God says soon, take it with a grain of salt, right? And so they'd be like, God's coming, he's gonna bring rain, and, ah! and nothing would happen for decades. And what would happen to Ezekiel? What would happen to Jeremiah? Their own people would be like, you are such a phony. You're such a fake. You're not even a real prophet. And Ezekiel and Jeremiah would go back to God and say, are you hearing this? Can you, can you do what you said you're gonna do? And God's like, yeah, I am, I am. When? Soon. <laughs> and, and James says, remember the prophets. Because they, they, they took some heat for saying that God is true and God is big and God will deliver and God will say, have you ever taken heat as a believer? God's faithful. He's faithful? You've lost your job. You lost your spouse. God's faithful? He, uh, <clears throat> yeah, he, he, he is. Your life's a wreck. God's faithful. 
Yeah, he, he's, he's, he's faithful. I don't think he is. I think God helps those who help themselves. My science teacher's favorite verse in the Bible, by the way, in high school, didn't have the heart to tell him, it's not in there, but. <laughs> and that leads us to Job and Job's experience, right? Job ended well, by the way, but in the meantime, he went through hell. And guess what his friends did? Job, you did something bad to deserve this. Job's like, I don't, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. And Job, instead of complaining to his friends, you know where he went? Now, Job complained, but he complained to the right person. Do you know who he complained to? God. A lot like David. Like, you ever read some of David's Psalms and you're like, this is bad. <laughs> David, you shouldn't, you're not allowed to say like, break the teeth of my enemy. Eat them with worms. And you're like, I don't know if this is the man after God's own heart. I don't know, man. But it was directed to who? God. And God can handle it. Job did the same thing. Are you up there? Are you serious right now? This is what you do to me? And God's like, come on, Job, let's get into it. I like it. I love you. In those patient times, the goal is not just, you know, put on a smile and just pretend. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. Everything's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Oh, no. I, 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 yeah, things are just terrible. I lost my job. <laughs> it's great. No, you, you, you take your complaints to God and say, God, this isn't fair. Work it out with God. Look what Job says. Job actually is quoted saying this. Though he slay me, I will hope in him, semicolon, yet I will argue my ways to his face. James says, do that. Be like Job. God can handle it, but you know what we do? We don't talk to God, but we go talking to other people, don't we? Well, you know what I actually think. And, then, and, 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 and that's why this is what we do. Look what verse nine says. Um, do not grumble against one another. You know why we do that, right? You know why it's the context of waiting? Because when you're waiting, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the Joneses aren't waiting anymore, like they're clearly out of their waiting season, and they need no patience because they have total opulence and abundance and the blessings of God have come down like a torrential downpour and you are still living in a barren desert like the servant Job, guess what we tend to do in community? We don't tend to walk around and go, aren't the Joneses a blessing? I just love them. I find them to be so kind and encouraging. I am so happy they have a job. I'm so happy their marriage is bliss. I'm so happy their children are healthy. I am so, in fact, I would much rather them be blessed than me. I love the Joneses. No, we don't do that. We find sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so and go, have you, so you know about the Joneses? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think they pay their taxes, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think they do. Yeah, I, I got concerns. I, I, I honestly have a check in my spirit. If you grew up in church, you know what I'm talking about. I got a check in my spirit about the Joneses. I just, you know, and I know, I, I heard they, they're giving a lot to the church. In fact, I heard they were handed out $100 bills. They are flaunting their money now. I think that's inappropriate. Yeah, they're giving, they're giving teenagers this Holy Ghost handshake, and I think it's inappropriate. You know, that's, we start to grumble, don't we? Why? Because we feel less, because someone else has more. And he says, don't do that. In fact, if you want to talk about the Joneses, go to God and talk about the Joneses. You have total license to do so. In fact, you're encouraged to do so. so. So go to God. Hey, God, I think the Joneses are thieves. <laughs> I don't like them at all. Take it to God. But let's not spread the toxicity. Let's not spread the grumbling and complaining. But what's so awesome is you can take your grumbling and complaining, it turns into a connection point with your God, with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Moving on. Because you tell me I have to end soon, like I blame you, you know. Ver verse 12, look, look at verse 12. He says, but above all, brothers, listen to that, but above all. That's interesting, but above all. Like, so like this seems to be more important than the previous passages, above all. Okay, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, this is so interesting, and it proves that our words have so much power, particularly within community. He's saying, hey, do what you say. That's what he's saying here. In other words, has what you say and what you do, are, are they ships passing in the night, or do they hold hands? 
You say you're gonna be somewhere and you don't do it. Now, if you're like me, I read this, this particular passage and I'm like, let's skim over this one. Because I suffer from what a lot of people my age suffer from and a lot of people younger than me suffer from and that is if I've scheduled something but something cooler or more fun becomes available, I'm gonna reschedule my previous engagement. Absolutely, every time, right? It's just like, oh, they'll understand and I'm totally that guy. I'm like, ah, I will reschedule, they're the best. You know, meanwhile, they're at Starbucks waiting for the meeting, and I'm like, hey, can we reschedule? I know it's 11.05, and I was supposed to be there five minutes ago, but I got a chance to play golf. You know, like that, and he says, don't do that. Don't do that. And he says, as a result, because we do that, we don't do what we say, we have to say, so I promise on the Bible, I swear, we have to overextend ourselves, because why? We are plagued by not doing what we say. He's saying for church community, we ought to be the difference. We ought to be the people who just do what they say. I'll be there, and we're there. And of course, I think what he's alluding to is what we're involved with is a matter of life and death. What we're involved with is serving one another. Life is short. We're all, all there are people in here suffering. There is, there's life and death situations. There are diagnoses in here. There are marriages on the verge. There are people struggling with emotional challenges and difficulties. There are things you're meeting with doctors about and lawyers about, and there's a lot going on in this room. And if we don't do what we say, people's lives will not be cared for, loved. They'll be missed. And all of a sudden, we fail to be the family of God. So he say, just do what you say. Show up for the meeting. Be there. And that is so challenging for me because if you're like me, you think of yourselves as just a dude. And so you're like, if I cancel, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. You know why? Because you represent Jesus. I represent Jesus. And so when I don't follow through, especially new believers or those who are seeking, they start to wonder, is Jesus like that? Is Jesus wishy-washy? Does Jesus not follow through? Does Jesus not keep his word? And aren't we Christians? Which literally means little Jesus. And so when little Jesus doesn't show up, people start to wonder about big Jesus. That's all. And so it's like, hey, if, if that's how you claim to follow Jesus, but you don't deliver on what you say. Yeah, no. That, that, that's why we can't just talk about prejudice and, and racism and marginalization in our country or any country. We can't just talk about it. We gotta do what we say. We gotta share the dinner table with one another. We gotta share our lives with one another. We gotta get our kids together and we've gotta understand one another. We can't just talk about it, we gotta do what we say. Or the world will start to wonder about big Jesus. Does big Jesus not deliver on what he says? So he says all this rhetoric of I promise, I promise, I give you my word, no, let's sign a contract. He's like, come on, we're supposed to be the difference. We're supposed to be the people that say yes, and it is as sure as done, because we agreed. No, we'll follow through. Yes, we'll follow through. He started to think about that and dream about it, and we're all, I think we're all guilty as charged. I know I am. And boy, you start to get a little excited about what a church could do if their yes was yes and their no was no. How we could represent big Jesus to this city and to our communities if we just did what we said. You know, and I, I just would suggest if you don't want to do it, just don't say it. That's why I tell preachers all the time. I said, if you don't live it, just don't preach it. Just don't ever preach on that subject. Like if you don't pray, don't teach on prayer. Cause we'll all tell that you are just teaching, but you're not living. So let's not, let's not live what we preach. Let's just preach what we live. Let's be those kind of people. And then, and then he, he goes on, and I'm coming to a close. That's why the piano, are these boxes crazy? This is insane. You know? But there's a door. You can't get out, so it's good. I love you. This young man, by the way, has been playing piano the entire weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Love you. And then, in, 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 in conclusion, you're like, conclusion, Judah, you have like 10 more verses. I love this part. Is anyone, is anyone among you suffering? 
Let them talk to God about it. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing praises. Do you see the communal dynamic here? He's saying, he's saying, hey, if you're really happy, turn it into a song so we can all sing together. He says this, he says, if anyone among you sick, now, when he says anyone among you sick, let him call the elders of the church. It's so early on in the church, when we say elders, you think of like a board, we have a board. But the eldership here, I look at the original language, the best thing you could say is kind of just leaders in the church. So it's not like, you know, people think elders, whoa, an ordained elder. That's not really what James is saying. Although that's fine too. I'm, I'm, I'm a board member and an elder and I'd love to pray for you. But he's actually just talking about leaders. Just, just people who are leading and serving in community. He says, if anyone's sick, call the leaders of the church and they will come pray over him. Now, that to you seems like, oh, that's, that's really sweet. That's, a lot of, that's nice pastoral care. But, but, it, but in these days, this is socially radical. Why? Because sick people were quarantined in ancient times. Sickness was way more serious, if I could say. I, I don't mean to be crude or insensitive, but there were so many diseases, very simple diseases we cure now that would obviously destroy people's lives and, and, and kill them. And so sick, when someone got sick, it was like, whoa, and they would be quarantined. In fact, by law, they'd have to be removed from the church gathering. But notice the church gathering comes to them. The world at the time moved away from sick people. The church at the time moved towards sick people. Do we still do that? By the, word, I I, by the way, I looked up sick. It doesn't just mean physically sick. It means emotionally. It means mentally. It means spiritually. Anyone who's weary. One of the words means weary or worn down. Call for leaders in the church to come to your home and surround you and say, we love you and we're gonna pray for you. This is the future of the church. It's always been, a, been supposed to be a part of the church, but I'm telling you where the church is going. And I appreciate our big buildings and I appreciate the, the, the amount of people that are here, but we are always going to be a small church with a lot of people. And what I mean, the future of the church, I'm telling you, church, the future of the church is there is good. We are going to have more tactile relationship and one on one ministry than we've ever had before. We are going to care for one another in a real, authentic, genuine way. It is the Bible. If there is anyone sick, get people from the church to your home and they will pray over you. That is the future of church home. We're going to care for people. We're going to extend ourselves. We're going to uh, disrupt our schedules to care for one another. And what the culture, the, 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 the people the culture moves away from, church home is going to move towards. Because that is part of our legacy. And I know horrible things have been done in the name of Jesus in the past. I'm aware of some of those things, and it's despicable. But we must also remember that there were days and times. One of our historical legacies is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go back to ancient times and you look at plagues, plagues that destroyed whole villages and towns, there are records that tell us that the whole town would move to the hills because of the plague. But guess who stayed? The only people that stayed in these towns to care for people dying of plagues were who? Christians, little old ladies who would say, I believe we're the hands and feet of Jesus. So everyone runs for the hills. We will run towards the sickness. We will run towards the darkness. We will run towards the brokenness and we will show the love of Jesus. And you know what we do? We outlast all the division. We outlast all the marginalized, we outlast all the insensitivity. We outlast all the dismissive attitudes. We're just gonna be here and we're just gonna care for people and we're gonna love people. And you may never listen to our sermons. You don't need to, because you're gonna see our lives. We're gonna care for you. We're gonna outlast you. We're just gonna care. We're gonna keep caring. And you're gonna say you hate us and we're gonna say we care about you and we love you. Which leads me, and I'm, and I'm, I'm so done. When I look at this way of caring for people, if they're sick and therefore confess, and then verse 16, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, you may be healed. By the way, that's not confessing all your detailed sin, it's just getting together at coffee, for instance, and saying, I need Jesus so much, he saved my life, I love him so much, let's pray together, and you pray together, and you grow, and God heals us, and God heals us, and God heals us. That healing, yes, it's physical healing, but more specifically, it's emotional healing, it's relational healing, it's social healing, and God wants to heal us, but we gotta get together and share tables of food and fellowship and 
share our pain and share maybe traditions that we've been taught that are wrong and not right and share them and get them on the table so that we can forgive each other and heal each other and live together and we could demonstrate the family of God. And it was Dr. King who said, to our most bitter opponents, we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. You want to talk about loving your enemies? Ha <laughs> ha, we shall meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we shall continue to love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much as moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Throw us in jail and we shall still love you. Send your herd of hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead and we shall still love you. But be assured that you will wear down by our capacity, we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves, we shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process and our victory will be a double victory. We, as the church, will continue to outlast the evil, the division, the hate, and we choose to love and to care and be concerned about everyone. We will not retaliate hate with more hate, for that in itself is hate. We will not do that. But for those who do not understand our God and do not understand our ways, for those who have come and those who have wandered away from the faith, for those who say, I don't believe that, I don't want that, I feel uncomfortable, I don't like that, we will not write you off. For if you have wandered, if you have chosen not to follow Jesus, you are still welcome here and we still love you. And so we're gonna show up at the community center. We're gonna show up at the job. We're gonna love you even if you don't love us. We're gonna keep caring, we're going to keep listening, we're going to keep loving, we're going to keep praying, and we're going to outlast it all. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because we're church home. And where there's a home, there's a family. And we're going to be a family. That's what we're going to do. We will wear you down. I hate you. I love you. Get out of here. I can't. I love you too much. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of church we're going to be, I love that James ends and I'm ending. Isn't that great? James ends and I'm ending. He says, if somebody wanders from the faith, he says, go after them. Don't write them off, go after them. And I, I know why James is doing this. Like, I get it now. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of jumping a bunch of verses here at the conclusion just for time. And I'm trying to navigate. So just bear with me. And God will connect the dots for you. But um. I know why he's saying if somebody wanders, go get them, because I think one of the most challenging things to do with our faith is to exercise faith and love towards people who have hurt us the most in church. And one of the most hurtful things in church is when you were close to somebody and you love somebody, and they, not only do they leave your life, they leave the community. And they say, I'm, I'm done with you and I'm done with this place. Those, if you've ever done life for an extended period of time in community, those are the most hurtful days. It feels like a tearing. It feels like a, almost, I don't mean to be insensitive, but it's like there's a, there's a divorce of sorts and you've lost somebody you love and now they're wandering even away. And notice that they're still called brothers and sisters, by the way. James makes a case that they're still gonna go to heaven, but they're wandering and we're all prone to wander. He says, you listen to me, churches. He said, don't write them off. Don't harbor unforgiveness. Go see them. Go find them. And this is before Google, and this is before Facebook. Now we definitely can find them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, reach out. Hey, praying for you, love you. Leave me alone, you're weird. I know, I just think about you a lot and think you're great. No, you don't. No, I, I, I really do. What if we were just that kind of church? Hurt us, walk away, turn your back on us, and we'll Facebook you. <laughs> and we'll like drive to where you live, because we can look it up, and just be like, hey, I just, just brought over a picnic. <laughs> I know it's raining, but you want to give it a go? What, what if we were just that kind of community? We, when people wander, we, we go out with them. Hey, are you okay? Yeah, just leave me alone. All right, well, I'll just... 
I'll just be here. Leave me alone. Nah, I'm just going to be here. Like, if you need me, I'll just be here. What are you doing? I'm just hanging, you know. All right, so you're going to, okay. Well, while you use the bathroom, I'll be right out here. <laughs> what if, what if we just loved like that? It's actually not complicated. And the reason it's not is because it's what Jesus did for us. The more we wandered, the more he pursued. God, what are you doing here? I just love you. Well, just give me some space. Nah. Well, I just want to do my own thing right now. Okay. I'll just be here watching you do your own thing. No, that makes it hard to do my own thing. Just leave me alone. Ugh. That's what God did for us. And so now James wants to conclude his letter by saying, love like that. Live like that. Go after wandering people and show them. And he says, when you do that, you will, I love this conclusion, you'll cover a multitude of sins. What if we could be a church that covers, not exposes, covers? We don't need to talk about that. We love you. You're good. No, no, no. Nobody needs to. We don't, no, 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 no. We don't have to expose. We love you. You're forgiven. We don't got to tell everybody in the church. We cover your, I got you. I got you. Hey, what's going on with the Joneses? They're good. They're good. That's all you need to know. Come on. Let's sing a song together. They're, they're good. We don't spread gossip. We just, we cover each other. And I, and I, accuse me of, you know, describing utopia. I don't know. Sue me. You know, like, I, Judah, this is ridiculous. Is it? It's just in the book, man. It's in the Bible. And I dream of a church like this. And I believe we're well on our way. But we got more to grow and more to do and more to live out and more to love. Let's be church home. That's why we changed the name because God told us to. Let's be a home, and where there is a home, there will be a family, a family that will love one another ridiculously. Amen. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're saying. I, I thank you for the book. I thank you for your story. You are, um, you are absolutely astounding, and we love you so much, Jesus. I can't, even, um, I can't even describe, even with a, with, with a word, who you are. Our hearts are overwhelmed and filled today that you have given us the privilege to be in your family and be your representatives. Oh God, we want to love like you. We want to live like you. For outside of you, there is no life. You are life and life more abundantly. If you're here today and you say, Judah, it's my time. I'd like to follow Jesus. I'd like to make a decision to follow Jesus. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. You know who you are. And the reason I ask people to lift their hands, I believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it becomes all the more real to you. So you know who you are. Today is your day. If you'd like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers, on the count of three, you lift up your hand, put it right back down. One, two, three. If that's you, shoot up your hand all over the room. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Anybody else? I receive and I believe in Jesus and his forgiveness. God, thank you for the forgiveness that flows freely in this room. Thank you that every single hand represents an eternal soul that is now forgiven forever without end. Now, God, help us to live out the love of Jesus. We dedicate again this community to you. Church home does not belong to a board. Church home does not belong to a leader or a pastor. It belongs to you, Lord Jesus. We are your family. We are your children. We are your sons and your daughters. And we want to represent our Father well in the streets of this city and every city you have put us in. Thanks be to God who causes us to triumph. You are the victor. You are the champion. We will not be overwhelmed at the odds. We will not be overwhelmed at the division and the pain and the wars and rumors of wars. Father, you have called us to live every day a part of the solution. And we thank you for confidence and we thank you for courage and we thank you for strength and we thank you for faith as we conclude the book of James. God, we ask, Lord, what happened to the half-brother of Jesus, James, what happened to us? We want more encounters with the reality of Jesus. We want to grow in our faith and living out our faith. We declare that, we pray that, we ask that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you believe that, would you say amen? Hey, if you're willing and able, would you stand with us and let's sing out these lyrics, these truths about our God. Come on. Hey, we hoped you loved it. We hope you had a good time. There's more for you. If you want to subscribe, Grace, what do they do? 
you click right over here. And if you want to see more videos, you click right over here. Perfect. We love you. Goodbye.